Uh, so in today's video, I wanted to talk about time trialing and how we become a better time trialist. Um, but more importantly, why I think that time trialing is uh, one of the more important disciplines of cycling. Um, if you can be good at time trialing, then I think that carries over to everything else. And I'm going to go into some data to explain why. Um, this is a little bit different to previous videos. Normally, I just sort of go over one study. Um, but today, I'm going to join some inferences from a few different studies. Um, to try and join some dots and give some practical recommendations anyway. So first things first, time trialists. Um, we often assume that time trialists have a very monster VO2 max. Um, and I'm gonna go into some reasons why I don't think that's entirely accurate. Um, Rowan is the exception to the rule. His VO2 is in the nineties or something. Um, so VO2 max, what, what is VO2 max? Um, VO2 max is a measure of the maximum amount of oxygen that a person can use during intense exercise. That bit I agree with. Um, it is often considered as the best indicator of cardiovascular fitness and is commonly used to assess an... Okay, it is commonly used to assess an individual's fitness. That I agree with. Is it considered the best indicator of cardiovascular fitness? Um, we can debate that point. Um, and we will be debating that point a little bit today anyway. Um, so what I thought I'd talk about is um, I was pushing some numbers around Excel and I came up with this the other day. So um, as you can see on the left-hand side, we've got 40 minute time trial in Watts and down the bottom, we've got VO2 max. Um, so this correlation um, was about three, uh, a correlation of, of about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 from memory. So it's not a particularly strong correlation um, between VO2 max and a 40 minute time trial performance. But what I'd like to do now is I'd like to cast our eyes onto this study, Improved Athletic Performance in Highly Trained Cyclists After Interval Training. This study came from 1996. Now, just a few points that I want to make. Just because the study is old doesn't mean that it's not relevant and doesn't mean that it's not important. Now, if you're struggling to cast your mind back to 1996, don't worry. I'm the same. I can't remember much from then. Other than the Prodigy were just about to release The Fat of the Land. That was actually released in 1996. Seven, and the single, the big one, Breathe, was released in 1996. So there's some fun facts for you anyway. That should at least help you position your brain into 1996. It was a good music back then. Um, so what you can see here from our 96 study is we have peak power on the left, which I'll refer to here on in as peak power output or PPO. Um and then we've got 40 kilometers um, TT speed down the bottom. So we're using a slightly different, we're using speed over watts, 96. They didn't have Wahoos back then. Um, now, before I go any further, we need to define what peak power output is. So PPO is the power that you achieve on the final stage of an in incremental exercise test, which we can do a number of ways. Um, your incremental exercise test is actually your VO2 max test, um, where we just, we chuck you on an ergo, we put a mask over you, and um, every couple of minutes we increase the power by 10 or 20 watts. Um, the one that you've probably done, and I think we've all done, is either the Zwift or the Trainer Road FTP, quote unquote, ramp tests anyway. Um, those ramp tests, they're basically just a, a glorified um glorified VO2 max test anyway. They don't tell you a hell of a lot other than just what your peak power output is on that particular day of the week. Um, but that's a story for another day. Um, so anyway, what we can see here is our correlation for this was 0.84. So we actually had a really strong correlation between peak power output and our 40 kilometer time, uh, 40, yeah, 40 kilometer time trial. Okay. So the next obvious question is how do we train peak power output. What I'd like you to bring you to this study here. I'm not going to go into too many details about this study. It was a bit of a wanker study. It was kind of irrelevant in the grand scheme of things, but I'll link it in the bottom. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was the intervention that they used and the results that they found. Um, this is in their control group. The test group was blood flow restriction. I don't give a shit about that stuff. Um, Participants completed four weeks of sit sprint interval training. Um, they were doing two sessions a week, which I would argue for sprint training is actually quite a lot. Um, each session was 
uh, repeated 30 second all out efforts separated by four, four and a half minutes. And they really tried to lay off the active recovery between them. So basically this was, was 30 second efforts all out. Um, and that is a, uh, particularly defining factor compared to say like your Tabata efforts, like your 30 by 30s or something like that. Um, so just keep that in mind when we're moving forwards. Now, I want to talk about the results here. Okay. So if we have a look at these results up here on the second and third uh, rows, are they rows? They're not columns, they're rows. Um, our VO2 max changed by about 1%. So I would argue that's probably just noise in the test. Trying to get a good VO2 max test result is like trying to hit a dartboard when you're on a boat and the, and the dartboard's on a different boat and it's a stormy day. Um, but what did change quite a lot is if we look at our peak power output here. So we can see that changed by about 6.87%. So that was actually quite a large difference, a large improvement in our peak power output. Now that actually correlated and they used a 15 kilometer time trial. So it's not a one for one replacement here. And I would say the shorter time trial does make a, a bit of a difference in the numbers that we're seeing here, but that correlated to about a 3% improvement in our time trial power. So however you look at it, if I could add 3% um, power output on your time trial in four weeks, I think that you would say yes pretty quickly. Um, so what are the take homes here? I think the one that I always come back to, and this is across all, to be honest, across all forms of life um, and across all forms of exercise and sport and particularly cycling is when in doubt, just get strong. If you don't know what to do, just go out and do something that involves getting strong. Um, and in this case, it was 30 second efforts. Now, is that to say that we discount our five minute efforts? No, I think it's still important that we work on developing a, a good robust five by five that has a strong fatigue resistance to it. But for the purpose of this discussion, the take home message is really focus on your um, 30 second efforts. And I might talk um, a little bit about talk and cadence um, in future videos, because I do think there's some interesting research coming out um, uh, about talk and how, and how talk is probably the, the missing factor in, in um, what we've been looking at um, in terms of uh, performance outcomes. Anyway, now, before I go, I know this is tacky and cliche, but um, if you're watching this, thank you. Please like the video. Um, please hit the sub subscribe button if you haven't already. And please share this video with your friends. Um, I know it's cliche, but this content is never going to get anywhere unless you, N equals one, um, actually do something and help me out. Um, and to the few people that have subscribed so far and the few people that have watched it, cheers. Thanks a lot. Anyway. Um, I hope you got something from this video. I hope you get something from my content in general. And uh, I look forward to next time I see you. So thanks a lot. Peace out.